Okay, folks, get out your clickers. We're going to find out if we learned anything last Friday. We've got a pop quiz going on. Newton's third law does not apply if the system is accelerating, true or false, with your clicker, people. With your clicker. <clears throat> Leave your clicker out. We've got several of these questions. Last call. False. That's not the right answer, people. I'm sorry, but the right answer is way false. Way false. Completely false. Sick and wrong. Okay? Yeah. Had to worry. Okay. Okay, let's try this one. Newton's third law companion forces never act on the same object. Never, ever, ever, ever on the same object. Never. Ever. Okay, last call. True is the correct answer. That is true. Remember, one of those forces is uh, breaking Chat's jaw, one of them is breaking my fist, okay? They act on uh, different objects. That is the answer to the problem that you just turned in. You know, you're pushing on the crate, how come the third law companion force doesn't, uh, um, how come it doesn't cancel out the force that you're pushing with? One is acting on the crate, one of them is acting on you. Good sir. Just for clarification, we turned in eight, not nine, right? We turned in eight. Okay. Nine is the last one where you push on the crate? Never mind. <laughs> okay. The problem you didn't turn. Thank you. Okay, let's try this one, everybody. Boy, that was the first time I've been wrong today. <laughs> Twice in one day and I give up teaching. One more thing. Go into real estate. <laughs> okay, last call. That is false. All forces have third law companions. Every single force is part of a marriage, part of a match set. Uh, even non-contact forces. And, uh, okay, last day we talked about this collision between the little red car and the great big truck, and what we found, what we convinced ourselves of, is that no matter how fast the truck was going, no matter how loaded down with gold bullion it was, that the force between the two was always the same for the red car and the big truck. That there was no way I could make that different for one of the vehicles. Now we looked at this simple example of the can on the table. We put it in the elevator with acceleration up. Again, that could be an elevator that's moving up and speeding up or moving down and slowing down. Either way, we have the same situation. Our diagram, our free body diagram, has to scream that acceleration. And so we see that the normal force and the weight force cannot be these third law companion forces. And we also can see that by the fact that they're not the same flavor of force, they don't have the same indices reversed, okay? And they're acting on the same dot. Now, if I look for the third law companion to that normal force, it would also be a normal force. And instead of table on the can, it would be can on the table. Because that's a force by the can on the table, it would be on a free body diagram of the table that would tick marks to indicate that those are always the same size. That gravitational force also has a uh, companion. If the earth is pulling on the can, the can is also pulling with a gravitational force on the earth and I would use two tick marks to indicate that those are equal by the third law. Now folks, here's the general principle. 
Anytime you're comparing two forces on the same object, on the same free body diagram, you are always, always, always going to use Newton's second law. And when you use Newton's second law, you have to qualify it. You have to say, the normal force is greater than the weight force. By Newton's second law, finish your sentence, with acceleration up. In other words, this diagram has to scream that acceleration up. Whenever you are using Newton's third law, you invoke it and shut your mouth. Okay, you say these two are equal and opposite by Newton's third law, full stop. Any more words out of your mouth are going to lose points. It's not equal by third law because it's not accelerated. It's not equal by third law because it is accelerated. It's not equal by third law because it's Tuesday. They're equal by third law. Full stop. They will be equal forever and ever, no matter what happens. They're equal. If we go back to the situation where there's no acceleration, either the elevator stops or it's going up at 300 meters per second, but it's a constant 300 meters per second. In that case, these two forces are equal and opposite by Newton's second law. Finish your sentence with zero acceleration. Okay? Whenever you invoke the second law, you have to qualify it. Now, we have this pretest. The last question on the pretest asked you um, to compare the force by the snow on the crate to the force by the crate on the snow during the time that the crate was crashing through the snow, still moving down but slowing down. And folks, that last part was just a waste of words. While it was moving down and slowing down, is it even relevant? What's relevant is that these are companion forces. Listen to the sing song. The force by the snow on the crate, the force by the crate on the snow. You can hear those indices get up and pirouette and come back down. So if they are third law companions, they're equal. Doesn't matter what the crate's doing. The crate could be stopped, accelerating downward, accelerating upward, doesn't matter. Am I making sense? Is it coming clear? Let's look at this problem uh, that you voted off the island. You have this log that's being pulled by this, uh, this tractor, and clearly I don't know tractors. I, I'm a city boy. Uh, anyway, that's what I think a tractor looks like. Anyway, if we draw a free body diagram for the log, the first force we put on any diagram is the weight force. Then we ask, are there any magnets? No. So what touches the log? Well, the chain, and it pulls. And the ground, and it pushes. Whenever one thing pushes on another, there will always be a normal force. And there may also be a friction force. On a rough surface, you're bound to have friction. We're going to talk about that today. And that would be the ground on the law. Now you were asked in this problem to find companionships. For each of the forces on your diagram, find its companion. All you were asked to do is just make a list of these four forces. Oops. Log. And then find the third law companion. And that's just trivial. I mean, you hope, you hope you have a problem like this on the exam, because it's free points. If this is a normal force, its companion will be a normal force. Instead of the ground on the log, it would be the log on the ground. This is a friction force, its companion is going to be a friction force. Ground on the log, log on the ground. And these two would be on a free body diagram of the ground, but I wasn't asked to draw that free body diagram. That's messy. It's got roots and houses on it, all sorts of things. This is a gravitational force. Its companion would be a gravitational force. Earth on the log, log 
pulling on the earth. And the tension force by the chain on the log, there's a tension force by the log on the chain. Now we've got four of the five, and we haven't even drawn the free body diagram for the tractor yet. For the tractor, I've got a weight force. Then I ask, are there any magnets? No. What touches the tractor? Well, there's a chain pulling. And there's the ground, and the ground's pushing. Whenever one thing pushes on another, there will always be a normal force. There may also be a friction force. Now, folks, let's, let's assume that this whole setup is accelerating to the right. I just made that up. Is there going to be a friction force in this problem? I've only got one more force to put on my diagram if I follow the recipe. Is there going to be a friction force in this problem? There better be. Because this diagram had better scream that acceleration. So I better have a friction force by the ground on the tractor. To the right, but the tractor's moving to the right. And how is it moving? It's moving because the wheels are pushing on the ground through a friction force back. If you can't convince yourself it's a friction force, imagine it's Bozeman in the wintertime. A different winter, not this winter, but <laughs> usual winters. Okay, those wheels would just spin. But with friction, you're able to push back on the ground with the turning wheels. Now, if the wheel's pushing back on the ground, then the ground's pushing forward on the wheel. The wheels attach part of the tractor, and that's what pushes the tractor across the field. That's what pushes your car down the freeway. Friction, okay? If you get rid of the friction, you don't go down the, the highway. Check that your neighbor's on the bus with that, people. start our discussion of friction with a pretest. You love them so. This pretest will not take long. Very straightforward. Uh, finished it yet. You can finish it before Friday. Uh, we will be going over it on Friday and Monday, and uh, we're going to use it to launch our discussion of friction today. I would ask that you write at the top of that, this may be wrong. As I went around the outside of the room, I found a lot of correct free body diagrams, and I found some many free body diagrams that were, were wrong. So uh, lest you study from that, for the next exam, please put your, make yourself a warning. Um, let's talk about friction. We've already discussed the fact that it's parallel to the surface. That if I take a general push, one at say 53 degrees, I can break that up into a perpendicular push, we call the normal force, and a parallel push, 
that involves the nooks and crannies of my hand grabbing the nooks and crannies of the table. And that force has to act parallel to the surface. It turns out that this force comes in two flavors. We call them static and kinetic. With static friction, there's no relative motion between the surfaces. If I push on this smart podium and it doesn't go anywhere, there's a friction force that is acting uh, so, so that I can't move it, okay? Now, kinetic friction, you can hear if you listen. You can hear the scraping going on. Now, this is what physicists call them, static and kinetic. I call them hard and easy. This kinetic friction that we're going to talk about today turns out to be just brutally simple. The static friction is one of the most challenging of all the forces, and so we'll tackle that on Friday. Now, let's talk about this kinetic friction. I slide this, and you can hear the scraping going on. That is the friction. What should that friction depend on? What is it about this crate or this floor that would determine how big that friction force is? I'm going to give you a hint. It's not the color of the crate. So what else might it be? Talk to your neighbor. See if your neighbor can sort this out. Okay, brave soul, raise your hand and share. What might it depend on? Where are you? Yes, sir. Uh, surface area. Surface area. Okay, what else? Is there a hand over here? Yes. The normal force. The normal force. Okay, what else? Over here. The coefficient, uh, how rough the surfaces are. Okay, what else? Mass. The mass. Anything else? The, uh, the accelerator gravity. Oh, acceleration of gravity? Okay, what planet we're on? What else? It turns out that to my mind, it should depend on all of these things. All of these things are very, very reasonable. And yet, it turns out that nature has given us a gift that is just fabulous. Nature has created a force that is so simple that it only, only depends on two things. How rough the surfaces are, whether I've got a hockey puck on ice or whether I've got sandpaper on wood, what the surfaces are like. And the second thing it depends on is how tightly those surfaces are pressed together or the normal force. And that's it. That's it. Now, I... I don't know why it doesn't depend on those other things. I can venture a guess. I mean, I think it should depend on the surface area. If I think of this book, what I'm saying here suggests that I'm going to have the same friction force whether I slide the book that way or whether I slide the book that way. Because the normal force is going to be the same and the surfaces are the same. But if I slide it this way, it seems like I've got more nooks and crannies to interact with the table. That should have more friction, I think. Would you mind if I push on your arm with just uh, five newtons, one pound of force? Would that be okay? Sure. Still okay? <laughs> Maybe not. A push of five newtons or one pound would be negligible if I spread it out over the surface of my hand. But if you've been to the doctor office, you know that that same one pound of force of the, you know, if it's all concentrated on the tip of a needle, that hurts, okay? And, uh, and so that's the difference between force and pressure. Pressure is how much force there is per unit area. Now, if I use that idea with this book, when the book is sliding like that, I have more surface area, so I have more nooks and crannies. 
but the normal force is spread out over a bigger area. The pressure is less. Those nooks and crannies aren't pushed into the table as much. When I slide this this way, um, I have fewer nooks and crannies, but now the same normal force is confined to a much smaller area. The pressure is greater. Those nooks and crannies are squeezed into each other more. And it just so happens, we're lucky, those two effects cancel out. Now, <laughs> quick story. Many, many years ago, my wife decided to take this class just for fun. And we decided that we wouldn't tell any of the students. She went to the tutorial, uh, she came to lectures, and we got away with it for a while. No one knew she was my wife. Then there was this uh, Valentine's Day dance out at the uh, Gallatin Gateway Inn. And my wife and I just loved ballroom dancing, and we were just swinging around, having a great time. And every time we went around, there was a student from the class. And we just, oh, dang, caught again, caught again. And so I was embarrassed. The very next lecture was this one on friction. And then when I got to this point, my wife's hand went up in the back, and I thought, this can't be good. My wife's questions are very, very hard. And she said, Professor, if what you say is true, why is it that when I sand down the wheels on my son's Pinewood Derby car to a point, he wins? Now, I knew what the answer was. It has nothing to do with friction. It has everything to do with rotational inertia, which we're going to cover the last week of class. I didn't want to go there, so I decided it was time to fess up. And I said, well, that would be my son's Pinewood Derby car, car as well. Class, I have to confess, I'm sleeping with one of the students in the <laughs> <laughs> She is the mother of my four children, and we've been married for 20 years at the time, now 35. Anyway. Um, what they were interested in was that she was not getting a grade for the class, so that would be important. <laughs> so, it's true. It only depends on these two things. Only on these two things. Now, if we look at this pretest that you just took, it gives us a way of measuring the friction force, okay? Remember, everything's moving at constant velocity, okay? If we're asked on that last question to compare the horizontal forces on the crate, well, let's get rid of the rock for now. We'll bring it back on Friday. But for now, let's get rid of it. If I draw the horizontal forces on the crate, I'm pushing on the crate, and the friction force is impeding the motion. And I put the force by me as greater because it's moving to the right. I'll wait. Is no one offended? <laughs> okay, someone's offended back there. Call me a liar. They have to be, okay, you wanted to say that all day. They have to be equal. Doesn't this one have to be a little bit bigger? No, they have to be exactly the same. If the acceleration is zero, the free body diagram has to scream zero. So it doesn't matter if I put the N, um, instead of N, I listed it as uh, F person? Uh, this one here, we're going to have all our forces labeled as one of our five flavors, either weight, magnetic, normal, friction, or tension. We're never going to have a general F. Okay. Now, this gives me a way of measuring the friction force. If I think of the friction as all these nooks and crannies grabbing each other, that would be very hard to, to measure. It, it happens over the whole surface. But I can indirectly measure that by just putting a bathroom scale between my hands and the crate. As I'm pushing, I can just look at the bathroom scale and see how hard I'm pushing. If I'm pushing at constant velocity, the friction force has to be equal to my push. So I'm also measuring with the bathroom scale the friction. Now we're going to do a little uh, experiment. And I have three volunteers. Thanks for volunteering. Come on up. I have a sled here. Your name, sir? Brandon. Brandon? Noah. Noah? Noah? Jenny. Jenny? Yes. Jenny, I want you to get on that sled. And gentlemen, I want you to uh, hold on to her arms so she doesn't fall off and sue the university, okay? It's your job. 
to make sure that we don't lose money on this. Now, I'm going to pull uh, Jenny across the, I'm sorry, but is Jenny? I got it right <laughs> at my age. Uh, I'm going to pull her across at constant velocity. Now, clearly, I have to speed her up to get to constant velocity. I don't want you to see that. So everyone close your eyes. Not you two, gentlemen. You keep your eyes open. Everyone else, close your eyes. I'll tell you when to open them. Okay, now you can open them. She's going at constant velocity, and the reading on the scale is about 180 newtons. Okay? Good job, guys. Good job. Okay, come on back. You're not done. Okay, Noah, get on there. The other, keep them safe. Everyone close your eyes until I get them up to speed. Oh my goodness. No, Brandon, you get on there. <laughs> Switch. Sorry. Okay, hold on. Okay, close your eyes. <laughs> Brandon, it's just like surfing. Get on there. <laughs> Stay on there. Okay, keep him on there. Okay, now you can look. He's going at constant velocity, and it's like 370. That's all I can do. <laughs> Let's give him my hand. If we, if we had the time and the energy to do this over and over again, we would find that all of our data points lie on a straight line. That as we increase the normal force between the sled and the floor by putting larger and larger people on there, we increase the tension force in the cable. Now. That tension force is an indirect measurement of the friction if the sled is moving at constant velocity. The friction has to equal the pull by the tension. Now, whenever I have a straight line graph like that, oh, first of all, what if instead of going at the speed I did, the slow speed, I had you close your eyes longer and got them up to a much faster speed. So they were just zipping across this room. What would happen to my, my graph? Yeah, you have no way of knowing, but if we had done it, nothing at all would happen to the graph. That's another gift from nature. It does not depend on how fast you're going. Now people, everything I'm saying today does not apply to the wheels on a drag car racer. They spin those wheels so fast that they get hot, they get rubber, the rubber starts to melt, they change state, okay? We're not talking about that. We're talking about regular surfaces going at regular speeds that you'd encounter in everyday life, okay? Now, if I have a straight line graph, your math class suggests that the equation for it is y is equal to mx plus b, this is the slope, this is the y-axis, the x-axis, this is the y-intercept, that line goes through zero, the y-axis axis is the friction, the x-axis is the normal force, and this slope, instead of an m, we give the Greek letter M a mu. And it's called the coefficient of kinetic friction. Now, let's see what that means. If I were to cover the bottom of that sled with sandpaper and do this over again with the same three people, would my graph look like this or that? Would it go higher or lower? Well, if this is the normal force with Jenny on there, and this is the normal force with Noah on there, with friction on the bottom of the sled, I'd have a bigger friction force. I'm sorry, with sandpaper on the bottom of the sled, I'd have a bigger friction force. So this one is a small uh, coefficient of kinetic friction, a small slope, and that's smooth surfaces. This one has a large slope, a large coefficient of kinetic friction, and that's the rough surface with the sandpaper. So that gives me a feeling of what this coefficient is. 
It's a measure of how rough the two surfaces are, how much the nooks and crannies are grabbing on each other. Now we use the symbol mu sub k to indicate it's for the kinetic friction. That suggests that we're going to encounter a mu sub s on Friday. It represents the roughness of the surfaces. It turns out there is no supercomputer on the planet that is powerful enough to calculate one of these coefficients. Every single mu has to be measured by some poor engineer that actually does a measurement between hockey puck and ice, and now I'm going to do sandpaper and wood, now I'm going to do a different kind of sandpaper and wood. It's got to be the most boring job in the world. Now, this coefficient is just a pure number. If I look at the equation for this friction force, kinetic friction is equal to mu sub k times the normal force. Now the friction is measured in newtons. And the normal force is measured in newtons. And that means if this equal sign is going to be valid, this coefficient is a pure number with no units. And it's a number that is greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to what? Actually, infinity. It's a common misconception that it has to be less than one. If you have super glue, you can make that mu as big as you want. Yes, you can, okay? It can be very, very big. Now, the other thing I want to point out is that in a really good three-body diagram, there's at least three normal forces. That's the most common type of force. And so if you're looking for the friction force between the floor and the block, you better use the normal force that has the same indices, floor and block. That's another advantage of our labeling system. Now, I'm going to help you with your homework. You always like it when I do. If I have a block sitting on a level surface, is the normal force equal to the weight in magnitude? Yes or no? Yes. yes, it is. What if I put that same block on an incline? No. Now it's no. Okay, and I can show that with a free body diagram. The first force I put on any diagram is a weight. Then ask, are there any magnets? No. What touches the block? The ramp, the incline. Does it push or does it pull? It pushes. Whenever one thing pushes on another, I will always have a normal force. I may also have a friction force. If this is dry ice on slate, there would be no friction and it would speed up down the ramp. If I were to tell you that it's moving down the ramp at a constant velocity, that would tell you there has to be a friction force. Now folks, ramp problems are hard. Ramp problems are messy mathematically. Ramp problems require you to solve two equations and two unknowns. Unless, unless you look at them just right. And I'm going to show you how to look at them. Okay? You've got to tip your head so that it lines up with the ramp. In other words, you have to rotate your coordinate system. If you rotate your coordinate system, all the forces in your free body diagram will line up with your coordinate system except one. But it's always the same one. It's always the weight force. And you always break up that weight force into components the same way. Now people, I'm an old man, I've been doing this a long time. On the midterm, you're gonna do it a whole lot of ways, a whole lot of different ways. But there's only one way that I'm going to call the right way, okay? The right way is you look in the direction of the normal force and you go the other way. 
until you can make a 90 degree turn, there's my 90 degrees, and get to the end of that weight vector. If you break it up that way, then this angle here will be that angle there, okay? If you break up your weight vector that way, those angles will be the same. Now, once you've broken up a vector into its components, you throw away the original and use the components. Once I've drawn a free body diagram, I get to use Newton's second law twice, once in what I'm calling the y direction, and once in what I'm calling the x direction. If there's no acceleration, this diagram has to screen balance in both directions. That means the normal force is equal to the y part of the weight. The friction force is going to balance the x part of the weight. Well, if the normal force balances just the y part of the weight, just part of the weight, the weight must be bigger than the normal force. And folks, that's the point, pardon the pun, behind the steep roofs on chalets in Montana, in the mountains. You want that roof to be as steep as possible. Because the steeper that roof, the smaller the normal force for a given weight of snow. And the friction between the, the roof and the snow depends on that normal force. You want that friction to be small so that the so that the snow will slip off, will slide off, and not crush your house. Okay? Now, I was hurrying because I wanted to get to this sample problem. This sample problem is very, very similar, by which I mean almost the same, as two of your homework problems. And you will definitely have a problem like this on the midterm. You have a 70 kilogram skier skiing down a slope that's angled 37 degrees. On your exam, it'll be 53 degrees. Okay, the coefficient of kinetic friction between the skis and the snow is 0.1. What is the skier's acceleration? Well, that's what we know, the mass and the coefficient of kinetic friction. We know the acceleration is down the ramp, but we don't know how big it is. We've known it's down the ramp since the first tutorial. We start with a free body diagram. We put the weight first, then we ask are there any magnets? No, Greg, you're being silly. What touches the uh, skier? Well, the hill, and it pushes. The snow pushes with a normal force on the skier, and it pushes with a friction force. We know there's a friction force because we're told what the coefficient of kinetic friction is. Now, this problem will be very, very difficult, requiring two equations and two unknowns, unless you tip your head. If you rotate your coordinate system to line up with the hill, then all the forces will be lined up with your coordinate system except for this one. We break up that weight force by looking in the direction of the normal force. Are you listening to me, all of you? Look in the direction of the normal force and go the other way. Till you can make a 90 degree turn and get to the end of that weight force. Okay? And that gives me my components. Now, which angle is 37 degrees? I'll show you a way to remember that forever. I have a spike through a board and a plumb bob. And when I have the board horizontal, the plumb bob and the spike are in the same direction, down. As I move the board up, it pulls the spike away from vertical. The more I pull the board up, the more the board, I'm sorry, the spike goes away from vertical. Let me show it on the screen. There's the spike, there's the plumb bob, the plumb bump always points straight down. As I move up the plank, the spike is moved away from vertical. The more I move it, the more the spike is moved away from vertical. So that those two angles have to be the same. Now, the plumb bump represents the weight force, always pointing straight down. The spike represents the negative y direction, 
which is the Y component of the weight. So if I go back here, there's the spike, there's the plumb bob. So the angle that's going to be the same as the board is this angle between the spike and the plumb bob. That make sense? Now, we're almost done. We got one minute, it's the most important minute of your life, I promise. You'll never have a more important minute. Once I break that force, the weight force, into its components, this is going to be 700 times the cosine of 37, 700 times the sine of 37. I can use Newton's second law in both directions. In the y direction, there's no acceleration. This has to screen balance in the y direction. If I've got 560 in the minus y direction, I have to have 560 in the positive y direction. Once I know the normal force, I can find the friction force because I have this coefficient. I just take the normal force and the coefficient and I multiply them together. That's the friction. If I take a tenth and multiply it by 560, I get 56. Now, last step, I use Newton's second law in the x direction. I have 420 newtons down the ramp, so it's positive. I have 56 newtons up the ramp, so it's negative. That equals the mass, 70 kilograms, times the acceleration. That gives me an acceleration of 5.2. Notice that this is less than 9.8. That is the goal of skiing, to keep your acceleration less than 9.8. If, uh, if you get to 9.8, your mom's not happy. Okay, we're out of time.